very, very excited for um, the chance to speak with some amazing people actually here at the DeFi Summit. Uh, and today we'll be talking about actually the opportunity and challenges ahead of us actually in applying the tools and technology available in the crypto space from the uh, from Bitcoin itself to NFTs uh, to DeFi actually yep, to the climate crisis. Uh, and for many of us watching here today, we understand that we're living through a very challenging time for the planet. Uh, we're also living through a very revolutionary time in the adoption of crypto assets as an asset class, also as uh, 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 institutional awareness and willingness to participate. And today here on the panel, we have some amazing people. Uh, we have John representing Project Arc, uh, working with uh, WWF actually to create uh, NFTs, actually conserve and protect the natural environment. We have Sabed, who is a very renowned um, NFT artist who has actually been collected around the world and also uh, has a deep passion for uh, using his art to make a difference. And we have Matt Tome, who is uh, uh, representing Sustainable Bitcoin Standard, uh, a new method and methodology to drive sustainability and energy usage uh, in uh, Bitcoin production. Uh, so we'll kick off. Um, I'm moderator and Max. Uh, very excited actually to curate this panel and actually uh, create an opportunity for us to discuss some of the most exciting topics of our space and the biggest challenges, uh, I think, of the next 10 years. Uh, so maybe we can just quickly kick off with a short introduction from each of your panelists about themselves, how you came here, uh, what drove you to do the things you did, and we can dive, uh, dive into the questions. Thank you. Um, John, do you want to start us off? Wonderful. So my name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the head of business development for Project ARC. Uh, Project ARC is a carbon neutral marketplace designed to empower animal and environmental conservation around the world by leveraging the power of digital collectibles and NFTs. Um, our project was born out of a, a very powerful uh, meeting that we had with the head of the WWF who was telling a story of holding one of the last endangered rhinos in her hands while it died. And that's a story that could resonate with anyone around the world. And we believe that um, you know, the power of art, you know, art is a movement, and art is politics, and art can change the hearts and minds of the world to directly affect how we engage with our natural world. Now, at the same time, this can dramatically revolutionize fundraising for these groups, whereby you know it's very hard, especially during COVID, to fundraise. A lot of these groups are fighting for the same round of grant funding. Um, you know, there's vanity projects from people that want to give large cash injections, and it's it's you know the market's drying up. So what we can do with NFTs is create a digital asset that lives for a lifetime on the blockchain that pays royalties every time it's bought and sold. More importantly, it can turn marketing and storytelling from a cost center to a revenue generating center. And you know, not everyone can buy an NFT, but certainly everyone who sees these NFTs can feel impacted by them. And if we motivate you know, a few people to donate 20 bucks a month to the group that we're supporting, well, then we did our job. So right now we're partnered with the World Wildlife Fund Panda Labs, which is their innovation wing, and a part of their project called Project Moonshots, which is working around the world to turn local communities into conservationists themselves. Uh, we're starting off with our Genesis drop uh, this week, actually, uh, in funding the WWF Romania and their mission to uh, reintroduce the endangered European bison back into the wild, which has been extinct in the wild since 1920. And thanks to the efforts uh, of the WWF since 2014, we're happy to report there's the largest uh, population of bison in the Southern Carpathians of Romania in almost 200 years. Now, conservation is 100% of the time a human problem, not an animal problem. And so what they've done is they're working with local communities to create collective reward systems and accountability to turn them into conservationists themselves. And they've seen tremendous success with that. And so what we're doing is we're using the power of art to tell the story of these communities, to tell the story of these animals, and to hopefully direct some, fun, some much needed funds um, back into their pockets. And the, the key crux of uh, Project ARC is that we wanna become a marketplace that creates a triple win scenario between artists that are passionate about telling a story, they want to give back and tell a story that's worth telling, and also make a living. And we want to collect those people with collectors that, um, you know, want something that's inherently unique and valuable and rare, but also know where every dollar they spend goes via the, you know, radical transparency of the blockchain. And then most importantly, these groups themselves, these projects, these impact projects. We want to, to tell the story of their work. We want to alleviate their financial concerns. And we want to ultimately just change the way the world uh, interacts and views our, our, our natural space and our environment and begins the, the process of shifting our consciousness to become protectors rather than takers from our natural resources. Thank you, Johnny, for that very, very eloquent uh, uh, description. It's obviously your passion in conservation is very strongly reflected in this cause. 
So I uh, appreciate you to be here on the panel with us. Um, Sabe, can you share a little bit of your journey actually uh, in the NFT space, you know, watching the evolution of the industry, you know, the, the growth actually of all of the people involved and also your, uh, your work as artists? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, as most of people know that I started in branding and advertising. And uh, so for the past, for the first 20 years of my career, that's where I started. Uh, it was a very fulfilling. Uh, there was aspects of it that were, but most of it wasn't. So I was always looking for a way out. And being a painter definitely gave me that freedom to be who I am and what I want to do and express myself, uh, you know, whether first was most mostly emotion based to uh, now, which is a little bit more mystical, uh, I started also having these healing abilities. And most people who have, you know, touched their lives with art would say that my work has these healing properties. Uh, so with that being said, I've donated uh, quite a bit of uh, paintings. There was times where five, ten years ago that uh, I'd be at a gala donating a, a you know, a piece that was selling for $20,000 for a cause. And uh, I myself might have not had, uh, you know, a, a portion of that in my bank account. Uh, so it's always uh, it's being able to give through art and heal through art has been a huge part of my ethos just because of the fact that uh, for two reasons. One, I've not always had the money to be able to support causes Two, uh, being kind of an empath. And I feel so much it's kind of hard for me to be. Uh, firsthand seeing animals in pain or human beings in pain or whatever it is. So there was always a buffer of being able to express that emotion, love and healing through art, and then be able to allow the people who cared about those specific causes uh, to use that art in, in the benefit of the cause. And uh, I probably donate to about seven to 10 organizations a year. And now I'm uh, excited to be partnering with John on some of his uh, ventures that that he's doing right now. So it's really, really exciting. Um, other than that, the NFT space is wild. I wasn't doing anything in the NFT world or blockchain world uh, four months ago. I jumped in February 15th, I ended up selling over six, 700 NFTs within the past three and a half, four months, uh, completely life-changing, obviously. And, and now not only the fact that NFTs is kind of uh, replaced my income as a painter in the real physical world, but now I'm having platforms to be able to do great things. For example, working with celebrities like um, uh, George Lopez and Conor McGregor and some other people that are coming out pretty soon, uh, all the way to I just was granted uh, uh, the funds to be able to do a, the largest, world's largest NFT show in the, in the world annually. And the first one is going to be called uh, Actually, all of them are going to be called Stratosphere, uh, NFT, uh, NFT Art International. And the first one is being held in Beijing. And uh, we're going to have 500 digital displays, including one that's over 18 meters tall in a 5,000 square meter uh, gallery. So backed by some of the most powerful, biggest auction, auction houses and galleries in the world, which will be named eventually. We, it, it is a DAO. So we do have a diverse group of uh, artists that are going to be uh, basically I call them, you know, the group of good people, kind people. And uh, we're going to just showcase artists for free. We're going to allow people to come and see it for free and uh, just to elevate and uh, also expand the market, you know, like really, really showcase what NFTs are capable of because we're going to have so many different artists we can show at the same time. We're talking 500 screens, so potentially up to 500 artists, depending on how many pieces we show. And I just shared that today. So whoever is uh, interested, it's sabit.art forward slash stratosphere, and they can submit their artwork for us to look at and hopefully showcase them. So there's a lot of exciting things that I wouldn't have been able to do pre-NFT world, whether it's on the personal level uh, or helping others or uh, elevating other artists, which I've been doing as soon as I got in. You know, So I probably... Uh, helped onboard over 500 artists myself uh, throughout the community with Clubhouse and Twitter and everything else. So it's just been a blast. I, I haven't, you know, I typically sleep about four to five hours a night, whereas before I used to love sleeping in. So, uh, and it's that it's just that energy that that just doesn't stop. So, I think we're on uh, February 15th. Today is June 10th. It's almost four months straight, uh, 16 hour days, but just pure joy. 
Wow. What, what, a, what an incredible sharing. And, and I think your, um, you, you mentioned about healing and sort of being attuned to the effect that your art has on people and the people who, who, who watch it, who experience it, and now being able to actually showcase it across the world and actually, you know, have, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people actually experience it uh, through this stratosphere collection is going to be absolutely phenomenal. So absolutely. Love to dive into a little bit more of those uh, with you, but thank you for sharing and really happy to have you here as well. Thank you for having uh, me. Matt, would you like to share a bit about yourself? Thanks, Max. Um, yeah, great to, great to chat with everyone today. So look, my, my background has come from traditional finance. I, I spent uh, 17 years uh, at two of the larger investment banks uh, and then the last 12 months at uh, a large digital asset um, in, in Asia. Um, and one of the big things I could see was this the, the institutional adoption of Bitcoin and obviously the, you know, the momentum behind that. Um, then recently I, I met with the Sustainable Bitcoin Standard guys and they were explaining to me the solution of, of you know, a carbon neutral Bitcoin um, and have recently joined the team um, because effectively it's combining two of my great passions, which is the environment and Bitcoin. So been working with the team and, and excited to talk about um, you know, the solution that we, we believe is an elegant solution to, to the problem that we're facing at the moment with Bitcoin, which is its carbon footprint, footprint uh, and its impact uh, across um, you know, the, the, the environment. So excited to talk about that. That, excited to talk about um, you know what we believe is is um, you know, a solution that will allow this corporate adoption uh, to continue, and also excited to talk about you know what we believe is is a solution for you know the Bitcoin miners who potentially are either using uh, a, a green green mining uh, infrastructure or those that are using you know, you know more traditional non renewable energy, uh, and we've come up with solutions for both of those two, um, which we hope will unlock this corporate adoption that that we have been seeing over you know, over the last you know 12 to 18 months thank you so much uh, matt and you know with the elon musk um set of tweets you know he's really brought the focal point of sustainability directly to um uh, bitcoin um and it's fascinating to see how the world of crypto and the world of climate change have really converged right both on the nft front as well as on the, on the bitcoin digital asset front uh dramatically i think in the last three to four weeks uh, so very excited to have you here and share a little bit about your experience interacting with institutional clients, you know, what they look for and, you know, how do they sort of think about uh, owning Bitcoin and any other digital assets? And also what are the responsibilities they have in these ESG disclosure and uh, climate awareness um, as they sort of look to, to put that into their portfolio? Um, so what I want to do is I want to dive into a little bit of the key projects each one of you guys are, are representing, uh, understand, you know, how do they... Uh, interact with the world beyond crypto, uh, and also how do they interact with the existing crypto community? Um, so starting with you, John, um, having interacted with many development agencies, uh, international um, sort of uh, projects, and looking at the needs and the requirements of WWF, what do you actually think is happening right now in the NGO space? Um, why are they looking to NFTs actually um, as, a, as a collaboration area? Um, and how do you think that interest is going to evolve over the next uh, few years? So one key thing that I think is is interesting is, you know, Sabit can, can attest to this, is that as an artist, when you have radical ownership of something, it's crazy. It's, it, it revolutionizes the space. And now that NFTs can do the same for NGOs themselves, this is a whole new concept to them. To not be at the mercy or the beck and call or the whims of, of other people, but to create something that tells a story through their lens that they own and that they can choose to spend how they see fit, that's something pretty revolutionary. I've spent hours on the phone with some of the world's leading conservation groups, and they tell me, you know, it's great to get a $2 million donation, but when it comes with a 300-point checklist and becomes a vanity project whereby I can't even spend it on the things that I know will create the most systemic change, that's a problem, right? This is a problem because the world's problems are so complex and so interconnected that we often only see the surface level and the people that are engaged in these problems day in and day out for 30 years of their career, they know best. And so NFTs create the ability to not only have the funds to do what they always thought they needed to do, but more importantly, they can tell the story that they need to tell through their own lens. Because let's face it, predominantly right now, the way that you get money for a conservation group is you play a SAG commercial and say, for $20 a month, you too can support this animal. And it's just sad. But why not have an immersive art experience like our partnership with Chainlink 
um, we can create real time living art. Let's say let's say we're supporting a group in a, a, a park in Africa, and there's a lion. And let's say that 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 uh, pack of lions grows. We can drop a baby lion into the art. Let's say it's raining that day. We can make the art rain. Let's say it's the wet season. It can be lush and green. That way, if somebody has this on their wall or in their wallet and they're looking at this art, they can feel a genuine connectivity to this and they can feel a genuine buy-in as to the outcome of how the project's doing. If it's a coral reef and God forbid the reef bleaches, we'll bleach that NFT. And that way the person says, holy hell, what happened to my art? And then they feel obligated to do something. This is art, right? It's connect human connectivity across miles. Because at the end of the day, we live in a world where at the touch of our fingers, we're connected to, and we feel empathy, just like Sav was saying, like we feel empathy with anyone around the world, regardless of what they're feeling. But this NFT space connects us. And so for the NGOs, I think they're mostly excited about being able to tell the story they want to tell, about being able to have assets that actually, uh, you know, have a return on their money every time that it, that, that it gets bought and sold. And more importantly, um, it's about exposing themselves to a whole different realm of people. You know, like the blockchain NFT collector space is is about this big right now. And I genuinely believe in the next 10 years, it's going to be massive, especially with gamification and the metaverse and, and World 2.0 coming into play. I genuinely feel that we're going to see a lot more engagement across the world from all different types of people. Because NF, the what NFTs are now is just a surface level of what they can be in about 5, 10, 20 years, right? Yeah, I really, really appreciate the vision of the dynamic NFTs, the ability actually for collectors to, to experience something that they see um, tying the, their digital representation to the physical world. Uh, and I can see that, you know, with uh, these conservation groups, if they can actually share the efforts and struggles that they face to the people who actually become their collectors and then stakeholders, that's actually a very powerful way for them to feel connected to the cause. Um, Sabit, I, I think you mentioned on this about how the NFT uh, journey has actually impacted yourself and also you know, brought you more resources, a lot more international opportunities. Can you share a little bit about the um, general affected NFT availability and, and existence of the industry has actually helped the artist community you know, experience this blossoming of creativity and also of, of resources? And where do you think um, this particular journey is going? How many people do you know our NFT artists from your own existing community and help them are still waiting to come join uh, this new world? I think one of the biggest things that the NFT world has done is open up the world of us being able to access our collectors directly, right? So, uh, and then the big art world now has to come to us to be able to participate, which is great. Uh, so for the first time in my life, I'm currently, as we speak, two of my pieces are at the world's biggest auction house, Poly, uh, which as a traditional artist with canvases and paper and everything else, the competition would be so difficult to get into, for example, at Christie's right now, right? Uh, for somebody like myself who's been painting for 20 years, but again, uh, there's so many that have already played the, uh, the route the way it was supposed to, the traditional route. And I didn't, I was selling artwork on Instagram. So an Instagram artist was never gonna be taken seriously by Christie's, for example, right now. Uh, which uh, leads to say that everybody who's actually in the NFT world right now is, uh, I, I think a lot of them aren't experiencing the success that they think they should be. And I, I'm, I'm trying to help some of those people kind of come up uh, as far as whatever that they're not doing from a branding strategy perspective of it. Uh, but there's a lot of guys who are actually doing really, really great. Uh, there is a lot of my friends who are not. I have invited people onto the chain. Uh, and there's some of them that go, you know, at the beginning looked at it. They thought I was crazy. I think uh, I think one person said, you need to go find God and come back. <laughs> I was like, what? Because I was so excited about it. The way I was talking, he thought I had lost my mind completely. Uh, for about three or four months, I was basically talking at the top of my lungs to everybody I called. Um, and uh, there's another person who called it a scam. He goes, oh, it looks a little, he saw one article about IFPS or IS, you know, the files aren't gonna be where they're supposed to be someday and the possibilities are that it could get lost and all you're paying for is nothing. And he's like, this is a scam, I'm not coming in, which was a, a horrible mistake uh, because he's got the talent and the ability to do super well in this space. Uh, and then there are other ones who, who see the beginning of jumping in with, uh, the wallets and the masks and 
MetaMask and this and that, so you know, heavy of a burden to enter that they're not willing to do it. Uh, there's also the other side of it too that they're probably not understanding is the whole building community and connecting with people and being on Clubhouse and Twitter. I didn't have a Twitter following or a Clubhouse following when I started three and a half months ago. And today, you know, uh, I'm pretty much about 7,000 in each one and doing really, really well. But that took a lot of work. That took 16 hours a day of like uh, five, six hours of working and painting and 10 hours of, uh, you know, communicating with other people and trying to help everybody else at, at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of challenges for artists, uh, especially most of us are not outgoing and, uh, you know, we do like our quiet. Uh, so when somebody says you got to do these steps, it, it becomes kind of like a daunting task. And, you know, so I've been really pushing people of getting over that hump and fear of uh, really putting themselves out there. Uh, but there is, I think the opportunity is some of the most incredible artists aren't even, haven't even reached uh, the space yet. So I'm, I'm excited to see how huge this is going to be. And again, with the opportunities of us actually helping build build uh, the NFT market, I think that's going to be uh, seen here very shortly. So our show is coming up next month. I mean, we decided the show the, about the show like last week. And things move really, really, really fast in this space. You know, each day seems to be equivalent to about three months right now. <laughs> this is really, really amazing. And I think um, maybe what people don't realize is that people who actually have been doing very well in the NFT space have actually come from very long backgrounds of actually practicing the art for a long period of time. And this is actually the flashpoint for them, to, so to speak. Um, and the uh, attention you have to sort of curating an image online to be able to actually communicate that digitally, that has actually given you superpowers, right? In the ability now to sort of use Clubhouse and use, uh, you know, Twitter to, to sort of broadcast to, to a large collection. Yeah, um, I mean, and I, I love what you're saying about, you know, traditional people coming to you. Now Now that Power Dynamics actually, their shoes on the other foot, so to speak. Yes. Uh, you have a lot more voice and a lot more uh, curative potential. Um, Absolutely. I mean, and that's that's another thing that people probably didn't notice. I came out of kind of nowhere. I think I had somebody go, who are you? Are you new from the Matrix? Because I just came in and like all of a sudden things worked out for me so easily and it was so effortless and, you know, 100, 200, 300 NFTs. And, you know, I even got some flat, you know, uh, lashback from some collectors going, you're minting too much. I'm like, is there such a thing as minting too much? I mean, if the market is there and people love my work and they're buying it because they love it, then let me let me mint more, you know, and uh, because the work itself I've been working on for 25 years. And, uh, you know, I had already been, because I've been selling online for about, I want to say about four to five years since 2016, I was really used to the fact of like painting, shooting it or editing it, putting it online, creating bonding curves for my website, creating flash sales where people, you know, these are the things I had to do for, to get people excited about my work and continue to purchase it, other than the fact that, you know, I had the healing abilities and things like that. So when I came into the NFT world, it was a very natural transition. Um, instead of my own web, uh, website, there was, you know, there was platforms. Instead of Instagram, it was Twitter. And the lastly, when I sold my first one, uh, the elating feeling was, wait, like it went for a half an ETH or something. And I was like, I don't have to, print anything. I don't have to sign anything. I don't have to box anything, you know? And I think that was when I felt like the reason why I call the show that's coming up stratosphere is because the ceiling in this little room just disappeared. I felt like there for about three and a half months, I felt like there was no room. There was, you know, the box ceased to exist. You know, there wasn't a box to think outside of. There was, there wow. was a box. So, and there still isn't, it's just getting, it's just getting more expensive. Definitely. And I'm really excited to see your show. And I think all the audiences here, you know, after hearing this, this panel, please go check out Sabe's uh, uh, upcoming uh, gallery, both online exhibition and also offline. Um, yeah, we're partnering with Spatial to yeah. to do the VR version of the show. So what, whatever 500 screens that we're going to have in real life, we'll have in a Spatial virtual reality gallery. Same week. It's, it's, it's going to be an art week, basically. That's super cool. So with our remaining time, I want to give the floor back to Matt. Um, I think that's, you know, you've spent uh, a very long time in traditional finance. You sort of understand all of the ins and outs of how, you know, you know, large sums of, of um, 
of asset managers, um, you know, think about the space and also now participating in the crypto revolution. Like, what do you think is that journey been for you, for you actually, you know, bridging these two worlds together? And then where do you think this conversation around Bitcoin and its carbon footprint is really evolving to? Do you think this is going to become the, the sort of ultimate test of, um, of, of Bitcoin's potential growth? Um, and as you Bitcoin being the sort of anchor asset of the entire crypto space, you know, in some ways this is actually the crux of the of the next stage of the crypto adoption uh, itself. Yeah, look, I, I agree with those comments. I, I think you know you can only see by you know by Elon's uh, Twitter messages and, and definitely the the community's messages, wider, broader community's message about Bitcoin that this is a problem that they need to address, and uh, it's something which which we believe through the sustainable Bitcoin standard is is something we can offer a solution. So, as this adoption continues, um, and and I've seen firsthand that you have you know the largest asset managers in the world uh, looking at this, you have large uh, pension funds and endowment funds wanting to now you know add bitcoin to their balance sheet and also corporates um, you know you're seeing a growing number of corporates from the micro strategies of the world to the squares to tesla um, to mass mutual who are all adding bitcoin to the balance sheet but the looming problem which has you know we, we are looking to try and address is that and as part of the success of bitcoin is that the carbon footprint of bitcoin is now contributing to climate change so you know, we believe that is is a threat to, to to bitcoin at the moment and also the negative perception that is has been growing in in the media and society and in government and, and across the regulatory environment as well um and so what we aim to do with the sustainable bitcoin standard is to try and create a, a respected international standard that will drive you know, the traceable sustainability in Bitcoin production and transfer in turn and address the critical concerns that you know, this community has spoken about and in turn, hopefully strengthen the long-term viability of, of Bitcoin and the network. Um, and, and to do that, you know, you know, I'd, I'd like to add for all the, all the Bitcoin maximalists out there is that in doing this, you know, we don't want to disrupt you know, the innate fungibility of Bitcoin. You know, there's, there's no concept they want to try and have it wrapped or, or tagged. If anything, though, we just want to recognize that a, a carbon neutral Bitcoin and a Bitcoin mine using non-renewable energy will be commingled into a common address and, and it's impossible to separate. So with that causes uh, a fungibility uh, problem, which we believe we can solve for. And you know, the sustainable Bitcoin standard offers a mechanism of certificates. Uh, which will hopefully address that fungibility problem, similar to what we've seen in the renewable energy certificates. Um, so, you know, this 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 concept of a, a carbon neutral mine will will win its block, and then the sustainable Bitcoin standard will issue an authenticated instrument called a sustainable Bitcoin certificate for each Bitcoin that is mined, um, and then the miner can sell that you know sustainable Bitcoin certificate or SBC to a carbon conscious investor. Which allows that you know end investor to claim carbon neutrality for the Bitcoin held in their positions uh, or portfolio. So, and and that we believe is very relevant for the ESG movement, which is happening certainly across you know globally within the corporate environment. Um, you know, ESG is is something, and ESG mandates is something which we're seeing increasingly focus from from end investors. Uh, you're seeing shareholders now who are who are addressing it at annual general meetings and addressing boards to make sure that you know, the, the money that they're investing into corporates uh, are done in, a, in an ESG compliant way. So we feel that Bitcoin now is as I reached that hurdle, but like Bitcoin and, and like the movement has continually looked to evolve and adapt. Um, we feel like you know, it will continue to solve for this. And, and, and we believe that you know, sustainable Bitcoin standard can do that. Thank you so much, Matt. And, and I think that's a, uh... The thought you've put into how the standard works is actually, you know, very reflective. You addressing both the concerns of the uh, crypto world itself, right, and actually preserving the fungibility of, of Bitcoin, to thinking about what the institutions want and how to actually uh, how they adopt and participate in this this challenge. Um, I really want to spend more time with all of you guys. You guys are doing fascinating things, and really appreciate the chance for us to be on the panel. In the last two minutes left, we want to give each of you guys a chance to have a quick one or two sentence summary of kind of the projects that you think, um, you know, of, of, the, of the sort of key message, mission, and uh, next step action items for each of the projects you represent. And also what can the audience do to learn more and actually participate uh, in your projects? Um, John, you wanna go first? 
Yeah, basically all I got to say is that art plus money is a movement, you know, story and resources is power. So go to project-arc.co, uh, take a look at our site, look at what we're doing. We've got a massive pipeline of two years worth of projects. There's something for everybody. And uh, let's put money in the pockets of people that are going to save uh, our, our nearest and dearest, most vulnerable species and the world we all share. Thank you, Sabi. Uh, same, uh, I'm excited to be able to not only elevate artists, but now animals with John. Uh, that's gonna be really, really exciting. So uh, every project that we're gonna be doing will always kind of have some sort of, uh, you know, human, human, humanitarian aspect to it, whether it's helping other humans or artists or elevating uh, artists or animals. You can find out uh, a lot about my work either on my Twitter at Sabet, S-A-B-E-T, or on my website, Sabet.art. And uh, hopefully you guys can join uh, the shows that we're doing virtually. And uh, the drop with George Lopez is on June 8th, and that's going to be exciting. That, that will also have a, a huge impact on uh, kids with kidney disease because a portion of the sales are going to go to uh, George Lopez's Kidney Foundation. So. It's exciting. Thank you. And Matt? Yeah, look, we, we believe that the Bitcoin um, movement and, and also the, the ESG movement is really only at its beginning. You know, these, these are two of the strongest trends that we're going to see you know, throughout our lifetime. So and also the, the carbon neutrality and, and, and you know, the focus on climate change. So we believe we have a solution now through the sustainable Bitcoin standard where you know, end investors, uh, carbon conscious investors, corporate investors and also Bitcoin miners um, can come up with uh, a win-win situation where not only can they produce uh, a carbon neutral Bitcoin or a carbon neutralized Bitcoin, but then the end investors can continue their mandates of an ESG uh, or a, a conscious carbon mandate to, to invest into Bitcoin and continue its movement and momentum across you know, the, the wider, broader asset management group. Thank you so much. And please uh, give a round of applause to all of our panelists. I just want to say as we close out that we're living through this amazing transformation, right? The ability for individuals to participate directly in the collection of art, in the funding of NGOs that do conservation, and now through the choices of, of, of Bitcoin and how they purchase it in the, actually the carbon neutrality and energy production question. There's never been a time where individuals have had more power actually to directly contribute. And I really hope that all of the audience members here uh, from this panel are inspired by the work that these people are doing um, and also think about how they can also become an agent of change through, their, through the blockchain actually at some of the biggest challenges we face today. So thank you again to DeFi Summit for having us and look forward to seeing you guys out there in the world.